Uh, flip side, when they start those distributions, you're going to be putting billions of dollars back into the hands of a lot of, you know, individuals and institutions that still want to own crypto. So the reverse side of this could be quite interesting where we have a lot of that flow come back. But I think it's just great that we're kind of moving past like what happened with Voyager and, you know, Celsius and uh, FTX. and. You know, we don't really see that type of, um, you know, bankruptcy risk right now. I mean, if, if these companies have survived this long, they most likely are going to make it. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome into the Thinking Crypto Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Edward, and with me is Chris Ryan, who's the head of Liquid Active Strategies at Galaxy. Chris, great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Chris, uh, excited to speak with you. Galaxy is doing some great things as it relates to crypto investment products and working with institutions and much more. And plus, you have a plethora of experience in TradFi. So lots of questions for you. Uh, let's start with your background. Where are you from and uh, what's your professional background as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I guess I'm from Central PA from where I grew up, a uh, small town in the middle of nowhere. But uh made my way to the big city for, for school. Um, right out of uh, university, I joined BlackRock, uh, which back then in the late 90s might have had 700 employees, um, much larger today. Um, there I spent uh, 12 years, uh, really as an analyst and then a portfolio manager. In 2012, I left BlackRock and went to a niche asset manager called Cohen and Steers, real asset manager. And uh, there I headed up the global natural resources strategy, uh, the strategic equities uh, strategies, and uh, was a co-PM of the listed infrastructure strategies. And then I finally made the jump uh, professionally over to crypto when I joined Galaxy in early 2022 to start launching a, a suite of actively managed products. Um, the first one being our liquid crypto strategy, which we launched in the frightful time of May 2022, uh, right when uh, Terra was having its, uh, you know, dominance over the market at that point. Um, but uh, we now have just over a two-year track record and uh, have built it to over 100 million in assets. Wow. Um, so I'd love to talk a bit about your transition from TradFi to crypto. You know, what was your first encounter with Bitcoin and how did that eventually lead to you saying, you know what? I'm going to leave TradFi. I'm going to go work in, in crypto and blockchain. Uh, yeah, great question. And probably not the same as many others. Um, I was actually uh, looking at NVIDIA in 2014, uh, investing in NVIDIA in our funds. And at that point in time on the calls, Jensen was talking about Bitcoin mining as being a source of demand for GPUs. Um, so the more work I did, um, and I was a, had a bit of a techie background, I decided to just spin up a Bitcoin mining rig um, and see what it was all about. And then that ended up leading to a number of them being spun up um, until my wife got very angry at how many were in our nursery. Um, so I actually mined Bitcoin with GPUs for a few years uh, until the halving actually in 2016. Um, and then ended up shutting that down um, just because, you know, at, you know, I think it was around a $900 price at that point. It was not necessarily economical, um, classic mistake. Mm. Um, and really, you know, I, I kept some Bitcoin in a wallet, uh, was really excited when I sold it in November of uh, 2017 for $7,500, was very angry in December when it was over $17,500. Um, but then, of course, we had the correction. And uh, 
for me, you know, as kind of I dealt further into crypto, then I had a good friend and he, I would still call him an Ethereum maxi, was telling me about Ethereum. I spent a lot of time looking into it and then seeing all of these other applications and protocols that were building on top of it. And it just started spreading from there. It's probably a similar story with many others and starting investing in it personally and then was thinking through, you know, there's going to be a market where at some point investors, institutional investors, family offices, they want to get exposure to this. And I don't feel like there are a lot of qualified managers who have run institutional capital before, who know how to manage risk, who know how to deal with clients and, and deal with client reporting. And uh, that's kind of what drew me to Galaxy and the platform they have with the asset management group here um, to really try and, and start that business from the ground up and, and provide a, a product like that, um, kind of top tier product with the risk management you would expect for institutional clients. I hope you don't mind me asking this question, but I'm curious, you know, you being an analyst working at these different firms and so forth, were you looking at crypto from a technical analysis standpoint back in 2016, 2017, or you were like, you know, I don't know what to make of this. Um, obviously, it wasn't a, as mature of a market as it is now with ETFs and so forth. But, you know, were you looking at uh, Elliott Wave, uh, Fibonacci models, all the, uh, uh, the metrics of on-chain supply and so forth? You know, I, I was looking at everything through the lens of uh, macro at that point. And I remember... Um, you know, in our National Resources Fund, we invested in a lot of miners, and I used to go to this quarterly mining dinner with McCory. And uh, at one of the, the dinners, uh, there was a gentleman, and he's like, what the hell is Bitcoin, and why does it keep going up? Um, and we started having this conversation about it. And, um, you know, I think the way I was looking at it, and I had charted kind of this whole like Chinese currency relative to Bitcoin and the moves were similar back in the time and then that relationship broke down. And then it seemed like every piece of data you could find that mapped out in a short period of time, then it would break down as well. So I think that's kind of the story of what we continue to do with Bitcoin. You know, mm. It was supposed to be an inflation hedge and then in 22, it wasn't necessarily an inflation hedge. We're constantly trying to find these, uh, you know, these drivers, these macro drivers, which are really kind of influencing the price. And I, I, we found in short periods of time they do, but the persistence um, does, hasn't necessarily been there. And I think the issue with Bitcoin is we just have a lack of, of, of history. Um, you know, every other asset class, be it equities or fixed income, you know, you have decades and decades of data to kind of scrape and go back on and look for these relationships because, as you know, correlations can come and go, but, you know, they could be higher for a longer period of time than lower. And I think as we continue to get more data in crypto, uh, we're going to continue to look at kind of where those correlations tend to be the highest relative to those that tend to be the lowest and use that to try and base our thought process off, at least from kind of a fundamental basis. Now, um, luckily for me, when I, when I uh, started at BlackRock, my, uh, my mentor, my portfolio manager was a statistician and he loved technical analysis. So I did use a bit of technical analysis as well. Um, to kind of help dictate, you know, where, you know, things look like opportunities. But I'm definitely of the camp where I don't use technical analysis in, in days and weeks, but I look at very long term trends and I look for long term breakouts and long term support levels. I think using technical analysis in short periods of time is, is really just a lot of noise. Yeah, definitely agree with you there. And you brought up such a great point that we don't have as much history. We're still trying to figure out all the use cases for Bitcoin. I think the strongest is probably digital gold, even though it was initially started to be or created as a digital currency. And, and don't get me wrong, it is that. But from a day-to-day -day use, you know, the fees and, and the speed and so forth is not ideal, but we can still use it that way, depending on which part of the world we're in. Um, but I guess maybe the strongest use case is digital gold. And what I found is it's the entire asset class is still correlated to global liquidity. And maybe that's part of the ethos, right? Uh, a hedge against the money printing. So it will rise with global money printing and, and you know, the, 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 the basement of fiat. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I think that's true, not just with U.S. central banks, but, you know, if you're a citizen living in Argentina and they're debasing the currency, if you buy Bitcoin, the benefit of that is, is you're now an asset that's priced in dollars. So mm -hmm. you actually can get away from that debasement using Bitcoin because it's priced in dollars. So if you think that your central bank is going to completely you know, erode the value of the currency, historically, you had to buy hard assets, you had to buy real estate. Um, you know, It's very difficult for a citizen in Argentina to buy NVIDIA or US equity. But right. It's much easier for them to get access to something like Bitcoin, which can actually preserve their wealth. Mm. Um, I did want to ask you, what, what is it like to see your old firm, BlackRock, and, and, and the other Wall Street giants now going all in on crypto. At one point, they were skeptics. They were bad talk shit, right? Larry Fink back in 2018. Now they're all in. They're they're building investment products. They're building with the technology, tokenizing, and much more. I I absolutely love it. Um, you know, I think it's really helping to to almost certify or clarify uh, digital assets as an investment class. And I think it's really helping to help drive the regulatory and, and political side of things into a less hostile kind of uh, playground mm -hmm. into something where they're like, okay, we now have many, many, many smart individuals who are talking about Bitcoin and crypto as a real asset um, and there's real value there. Maybe we should soften our stance a little bit and start to really proactively, not proactively, but more productively work with crypto companies and, and hopefully drop some of these, you know, lawsuits and things like that. You know, for BlackRock, I'd say their solutions business, their technology platform is, is top notch and they've got a lot of great um, engineers there. Um, I would love to see them build out, you know, risk management platforms, like things that are just missing from uh, kind of crypto portfolio management that I'm certain that they could really make a part of, of their broader platform. Mm. Um, now with BlackRock and these firms getting involved on launching ETFs and so forth, how, what type of impact has that had on Galaxy's bi business? Have you seen an influx of demand for uh, from institutions for crypto products? Yeah, so I guess the, the knee-jerk uh, response is that before ETFs, the only way for in investors to get access was through private fund vehicles. Mm. And what we've definitely seen is a reduction in the, the holdings in private funds that have rotated into ETFs. Now, luckily, we're uh, partnered with Invesco on both the Bitcoin and the Ethereum ETF, and we've kind of been able to kind of route that flow back into those products. Mm. Um, so there's been a little bit of uh, you know product switching going on. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of what it's done for investors, it has only been positive. And I can say with complete certainty that if we didn't have those ETFs this year, we would not have the same type of conversations we're having today. And, mm -hmm. you know, FTX was a, a huge, um, you know, impact to the credibility of crypto. And you know, the, the discussions with institutions just kept falling and falling and falling, even through 2023. Um, but now that we have these ETFs, um, those discussions are starting to pick back up again. And we're hearing more that we have to do our homework um, because they're starting to realize that, hey, this might be a very legitimate asset class in the not too distant future. And we don't want to be left behind. Mm. It, it, and to your point of the FTX situation, it feels the dark clouds of those days have been pushed away. There's a bit of sunshine. And I don't know, it's it's like we've turned a new leaf because folks have completely forgotten about that. And, you know, like you said, there's a legitimacy now. The, the stigma is gone and uh, more people want to learn about it, want to uh, put it into their portfolios. And it's almost like you have a fiduciary duty to do that now because other products like bonds and so forth are not uh, are not performing as well. Yeah, it's true. You know, um, I, many people might know this. So we've actually worked very closely with the FTX estate in, in winding down a lot of their exposure because the bankruptcy court told them that they have to make returns to creditors as cash. So um, when we think about just the rally that markets have had since, you know, September, and that was in the face of us selling billions of dollars of crypto 
it's pretty impressive. So uh, flip side, when they start those distributions, you're going to be putting billions of dollars back into the hands of a lot of, you know, individuals and institutions that still want to own crypto. So the reverse side of this could be quite interesting where we have a lot of that flow come back. But I think it's just great that we're kind of moving past like what happened with Voyager and, you know, Celsius and uh, FTX and you know, we don't really see that type of, um, you know, bankruptcy risk right now. I mean, if, if these companies have survived this long, they most likely are going to make it. And the levels of leverage in the market are just way down. The levels of speculation on, you know, a product that constantly returns 20 percent is, is not there. So I feel like the environment has has kind of been cleaned up um, and it's definitely more amenable for investment um, than it had been back in kind of that, you know, 21, 22, where things definitely got pretty frothy. Yeah. yeah. And and to your point of, um, you know, cleaning up the, of the environment, I noticed that the standards have been raised significantly with many exchanges uh, with proof of reserves and transparency reports. And, uh, you know, you, you look back and you're like, why weren't these things in place in the, <laughs> you know, but I guess you live and you learn and um, hopefully we can put those type of issues and collapses behind us. And um, I, I've been, you know, saying to some people, it almost feels like the kids have been put to bed and the adults are in the room now. And, and some of the adults are from wall street, right. Um, uh, galaxy black rock and so on and so forth. And, uh, where you have trust in these brands and institutions and proper custody and all, all those things. Yeah. I mean, we had the financial crisis of crypto, um, mm. you know, back in the mid two thousands, it was the banks that were really, you know, taking obscene leverage and putting together products that made no sense. And that led to a lot of regulation changes, you know, Dodd Frank and, and numerous other uh, regulatory um, acts that were put into place. And I think kind of the cleanup process is happening right now as well. Um, and this is, goes back to what you say, like people are demanding more information. They want to make sure that their assets are safe. Um, but what we really need is that regulatory side to 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 shape up a bit so that we can get those same type of protections that make sense in place. Mm. Now, there was some big news uh, issued today around Galaxy, and that is a $113 million initial close of the Galaxy Ventures Fund 1. Tell us about that. Yes. Yeah, so it, this is the team that's been working at Galaxy, investing on our balance sheet for the past five years. And uh, we probably, I, we definitely have over a hundred different investments of, uh, you know, venture-based companies on balance sheet. We made the decision that it would make more sense if we moved that team over to the asset management group and, you know, Galaxy Parent Co can still invest uh, capital into the fund if they want and participate, but now we can also take outside capital as well. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, the team's really excited. You know, it's going to focus on early stage investments and it's more focused on kind of the infrastructure layers of crypto, the payments type of companies in crypto. Um, and, you know, we're I'm on the investment committee as well. We're looking at a range of different companies there um, that are really interesting, really unique and are finding these niche opportunities and opportunities that could grow quite significantly um in the marketplace mm. um and are there plans to do other rounds um of funding this year or into next year yeah so we will probably have a second close in in the fall um and i have to give props to kind of our team for for putting together the, the first close as quickly as they did um i feel like they only spent maybe two months on it um and it was just too fast for a number of investors where the ic takes a little bit more time so we're expecting second close in Q4 and uh, feel quite confident that that's going to push the fund up to about 150 million. Mm -hmm. And the team's comfortable with that level of capital going into these early stage companies, because in early stage, you know, uh, you're not investing significant chunks of money. Uh, we're typically doing maybe three million, five million, if you're lucky, type tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, and the team wants to have, you know, a portfolio of maybe 30 to 35 different names. And I don't know if you're able to tell us names or maybe the types of institutions you're raising from. Is it endowments, family offices, and so forth? 
Um, so I would say there were a number of family offices. Uh, there was a, a very well-known uh, fund to fund. Um, you know, those right now are tend to be the the biggest investors. There's still a lot of high net worth individuals that invest as well. Um, and we actually uh, enabled employees to invest uh, into the strategy as well. Awesome. Um, now, the Ethereum spot ETFs launched this week. And of course, Galaxy, as you mentioned, Galaxy and Invesco have the QETH uh, ETF. And I would love to get your thoughts on how that uh, launch went and what's your outlook for these ETFs. Uh, obviously, I don't think there's going to be as much demand as there was for Bitcoin, but certainly significant and, and we're seeing good performance so far. Yeah. So um, the launch, of course, I think with all of the issuers was, was very much a surprise on the 19 befores. Um, nobody had marketing plans in place. Nobody really uh, was prepared for it. So uh, we had a very fast sprint in the you know month or so between the 19 befores and the S ones being approved. Um, but uh, you know all of the issuers got the docs in the SEC um, approved, and we were up into the races. So. I agree with your assessment that I think there's a good long-term opportunity. Um, tactically, I, I'm just you know seeing what happened with GBTC and knowing that we have a lot of arms still in the ETHE product. Uh, we actually reduced our ETH exposure uh, just two days ago, um, just thinking through the fact that I think flows are just going to really struggle in the near term, mm -hmm. and it's really going to be due to the ETH outflows. And I think similar to what happened with Bitcoin, where we had a bit of a right. pullback, we might see that with Ethereum, and we're going to use that opportunity to step back in. And as those, you know, reductions from ETH kind of start trickling down, then those positive flows are going to overwhelm that. And I think it's going to be better market sentiment afterwards. Yeah, good, great point. We saw a bit, like you said, of that with the Bitcoin ETF situation, and it's just you know, uh, it'll resolve itself and then eventually we'll be in, on good ground there. Um, I know one of the things that people are really bullish on with Ethereum is staking, right? The ability to earn yield and the passive rewards, but those are not available in the Ethereum ETFs as yet. Um, are you guys engaged with the SEC asking them about this? I, I saw Hester Peirce, commissioner of the SEC, spoke about it recently. And do you think once that's added, that will have a surge in demand for ETH? So um, I think it's going to take a little time uh, for the SEC to, to come around to that. You know, Gensler has, has already publicly stated that, you know, staked ETH is a security, but ETH is not. Yeah. Um, so we kind of have to really work with the SEC to make sure that they realize what staking is, why it's done, instituted being a security. But um, just knowing, you know, how things work with the SEC, I don't think that that's going to be something that's completed this year. Um, I do think, to your point, if staking is introduced into the ETFs, it, it's a huge positive. And I think a lot of um, individuals, you know, I have a very close friend. He's like, why would I ever move my coin to an ETF when I can stake it and generate yield? Uh, um, he said, if it, if, if it would stake it in the ETF, easy because you know i want all of my assets to be in one tidy place where i can manage them um so i do think we would see a bit of a pickup in flows from people who had been staking on their own and moving those into uh, the etfs and part of that is you know when a retail user stakes the take rate um from whoever is staking that tends to be higher mm -hmm. and when you negotiate with these big issuers because there's going to be so much volume we can kind of negotiate that take rate down so the end coin coming to the, the staker or to the ETF could be much higher. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm like your friend. I'm of the same mindset. I stake ETH. I, I, I self-custody for the most part. Um, and I don't want to you know, go through the ETF because I won't be earning a reward. So uh, hopefully you know, the SEC can come around soon. I think that would be really great for the, the ETFs and for the market at large and giving retail the general public who who may not be you know crypto enthusiasts and and techies uh, and so forth they can at least get some of those rewards so hopefully yeah, they yeah. can get it soon 
Um, now, Solana has been on the rise uh, significantly, getting adoption and so forth. Uh, it, it's, it's now within the top five of the crypto market cap. Some folks have filed for a Solana ETF. Uh, are you guys planning to do that? And do you think we see that in 2025? I would give 2025 kind of a, a 40, 60, 40, uh, 60, no. Um, 2026, I'd probably say the odds are much higher. Um, you know, Solana's in the same boat that it was named as a security in one of the SEC lawsuits against Coinbase. So we kind of have to first, you know, backtrack on that. Sure. Um, I think it would be fantastic. And to be fair, if we can get the staking in ETH, we would definitely want the staking in Solana as well, because the reward rate is, is actually quite a bit higher with Solana mm. right now. But, you know, activity in Solana ecosystem has picked up significantly and it was left for dead after the FTX collapse. But more recently, we even see DeFi volumes exceeding that of Ethereum now. So the ecosystem continues to grow. I think people are catching on to, to what's going on there. And I think, you know, the prospects for Solana look quite well. I would love to see an ETF, but I just think it's going to take a little bit more time until we can get there. Yeah, uh, there's, to your point, the complications of those lawsuits against exchanges where Solana is named. But um, possibly, uh, Chris, you know, Congress is able to get something like the Fit 21 bill to go through the Senate and then whoever becomes president, you know, they sign into law by 2025. That could, you know, escalate things incredibly fast uh, and, and maybe we see it. But until then, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. And, you know, I think the Senate is going to have their hands tied into the election. So, you know, whether they, you know, put their fingers on it and make some edits and send it back to the House this year, or if it gets pushed to early next year, it remains to be seen. But, you know, I, I'm kind of encouraged by what I hear about the Harris camp and kind of what their view is on crypto. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it feels like you know, it feels like crypto has kind of checkmated the politics a bit where there's a lot of voters uh, that own crypto and like crypto. And this is going to be a very, very close presidential race. And the crypto voter could really sway which direction that goes, particularly in some of these swing states. So I wouldn't be surprised if the, uh, the Harris camp comes out and takes a different approach to uh, crypto than the you know, Biden's administration. I certainly hope so. Um, and I'm I'm I spoke to like Congressman Ro Khanna just yesterday and he's been you know talking about he's talking to her camp and so forth. And um it would be great to not have crypto be a partisan issue, but it, and it shouldn't even be an election issue, but it is because of Elizabeth Warren, I think is a culprit behind that. Um, but what are your thoughts on man, it just seemed like a switch flipped earlier this year. And, you know, Donald Trump certainly took advantage of it where he saw his opponents on the on the, the Democrat side were trashing this technology and, you know, doing all kinds of things with it, with regulation by enforcement. And, you know, look, as a politician, that's a smart move. It's the art of war, right? You expose your enemy's uh, uh, weakness and so forth. Uh, but it's incredible. He's going to be speaking at the Bitcoin conference, you know, on Saturday, uh, and possibly announcing a plan to have Bitcoin be used as a treasury reserve asset. It's it's pretty incredible. Yeah, um, if he says it, well, he he's, he he says whatever hits him on the top of the mind. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I, most of his advisors would probably tell him not to say that, uh, but I, it doesn't mean that it will stop him from saying that. But I think it's, you know, it's a really good signal to the crypto community that, um, you know, he's going to take crypto seriously. Um, and from what I heard, Harris's camp, they were actually seriously considering going um, and uh, they decided not to at the end of the day, which is probably the right you know decision for her, too, because um, I don't know if the Bitcoin crowd would have been nearly as uh, as kind to her as I think they will be to Trump. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's it's fascinating. And and you, I read the other day that Fair Shake has the largest super PAC within this election. And it's, of course, crypto funded, right, from Ripple, A16Z, Coinbase, and so forth. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? It, it's it, Crypto has become like this political force now. 
Yeah, and I think it's because we've been asking for you know changes to regulations. We've been asking for you know politicians to really force the SEC in a certain direction to set the rules. And really, there's only been one candidate who's really talked about that. And if this is the only way that we can get traction on the things we've been asking for for years, then we're going to put capital behind that and make sure that those types of initiatives finally get played out because it has been such a barrier to, you know, crypto employment in the U.S., crypto companies in the U.S., using crypto protocols in the U.S., um, and it's frustrating. So would love to see, you know, either camp um, take a, a, you know, a better view to, to really, you know, embracing crypto and creating sensible regulations that make sense and, it creates a little bit more comfort from institutional investors to finally commit some capital to the space. Mm. Um, I wanted to go back to the Bitcoin ETFs because obviously we saw record-breaking performance and inflows for the ETFs. And um, part of the process right now is folks are going out educating RIAs and wealth managers and so forth. So it's only been, what, six, seven months uh, since the launch. Um, so I think we need like a year to kind of judge uh, the performance overall, but what is what is your outlook? Do you, do you expect inflows to uh, come in waves and and uh, to increase as well? Yeah, I think uh, it's the most successful ETF launch in the history of ETFs. I um, mean, you have seen just tens of billions of dollars flow into these products, and it's been just incredible to watch. Um, you know, I think in in many of the big wirehouses and platforms. Bitcoin still hasn't even been approved. And mm -hmm. in many cases, financial advisors still have to wait for reverse inquiry um, to be able to offer them to clients. So there is still a huge pool of untapped investors um, that have yet to invest. And I think there is just going to be this steady inflow into the ETFs over time as you finally get more of these platforms onboarding as you anniversary, you know, kind of a one year probation period, there's there's so many weird things that go on in the RIA landscape that have to kind of play out. But each RIA is different. You know, you've got smaller ones, you've got big public ones, but all of that is going to lead to just this steady flow into the Bitcoin ETFs over time. And, you know, I think that's gonna to continue to, to paint a very solid picture for the opportunities for Bitcoin going forward. And I would really, I'm really excited to see a, an options market develop on these Bitcoin ETFs as well. So, um, you know, hopefully we can we can get some traction on that and maybe have that in place by Q4. I think that's going to improve a lot of liquidity. I think it's going to increase interest in in the ETFs. Um, so that would be a huge catalyst for me as well. So, Chris, not financial advice, but what what is your expectation for this bull market, given that? Uh, right now we're cooling down a bit. Uh, maybe the stock market's been a bit overbought. You know, there's some correlation there. Uh, the DXY is finding some strength on the daily chart. Uh, maybe the market's waiting to see what the Refed is going to do with rate cuts. Do you are you seeing higher highs into 2025, or uh, you know, <laughs> are we going to be kind of in a sideways movement for a while? I, I think um, everyone is going to be surprised by what happens on, on the political side. Mm. And I, I think, um, you know, whether it's Trump or Harris, um, there's going to be progress. And that's not expected. And then, you know, I think of the FTX stimulus when you're putting, you know, the retail crowd and then some of the institutions that were crypto funds even if you call it only 6 billion of the 16 billion, that's $6 billion that could flow back into crypto. Um, everyone's focused on German government selling and, you know, Mount Gox returns. Um, I'm less focused on that in the near term. And I'm thinking, you know, six to 12 months out, there are some massive catalysts that are kind of on my radar. And I think that's really going to help propel, um, you know, Bitcoin higher. And smart investors would be looking at that and, and kind of taking advantage of, of weakness, um, I think, in, in, in the market today. 
Mm. Um, what are your thoughts on companies adding Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset on, on their balance sheet? Uh, just this morning, I think uh, Marathon Digital Holdings, they're a miner, but they bought $100 million in Bitcoin. Uh, it, we know Tesla, SpaceX, MicroStrategy. I'm watching Michael Dell closely. Uh, he's been tweeting a lot about Bitcoin. You know, Could Dell announce something soon? It's possible. But what are your thoughts on that trend? Yeah, um, and, and the best one is MetaPlanet, which went from 20 yen to 220 yen, I think today, 10x on just on adding Bitcoin to their uh, to their treasury. And this is a company that generates like $2 million of revenue per year. Wow. And it's probably valued at like a quarter billion dollars now. Um, you know, I, I think it's evidence that more and more, um, you know, senior individuals and companies are recognizing the value of, of keeping it in the treasury. Yeah. Now, Marathon, clearly, this is their business. They're, they're a Bitcoin miner. And, you know, they have historically, they have held a lot of Bitcoin and saved a lot of Bitcoin um, on their balance sheet. And they've got a substantial amount of Bitcoin. So I, I don't find it surprising um, that they're taking that route. I think the micro strategy kind of uh, case study has been a bit of a success. A lot of us thought that once the ETFs came, MicroStrategy stock was just going to collapse because why would you pay for a premium for that Bitcoin when you can get the ETF? But, you know, it, it's a bit of a, a, a system that works because if you can issue equity or, or some type of, of finance based on a valuation that's 2x Bitcoin, and then you can buy the underlying asset for half the value of what your company is worth, well, that's creating value on its own. So um, doesn't surprise me that other companies are taking a look at that and, and really diversifying um, some of the treasuries. A question, a follow-up question on that. I, I, I don't know if I'm off base here, but is it also kind of a dual benefit in that stocks um, rise with the depreciation, or excuse me, the debasement of fiat, right? And global liquidity. Um, where if you're in the NASDAQ, I mean, you know, NASDAQ is, is a top performing index, of course, and, and you have Bitcoin, is it the best of both worlds? Uh, is it a, a way to kind of diversify? Like I can hold Bitcoin, but you know what? I can grab some micro strategy stock because it's getting the overall stock market benefit. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. Um, it could be, um, you know, I think, I think time will tell. Uh, we're, we're still in a very narrow period of time on which this has been going on. Yeah. Um, you know, clearly it was disappointing when, you know, Tesla made a change to kind of how they were approaching Bitcoin. Would be lovely to see them readopt it. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of people that look to certain individuals as very smart individuals. Um, you know, Elon Musk being one of them. Uh, I love, you know, seeing Mark Cuban. He's he's always supporting kind of crypto and he, he's really, you know, kind of immersed himself in crypto as well. And, and these are people that have made billions of dollars. Um, so why would you not want to trust somebody who actually is, is, is done really well in their life and probably knows how to make a calculated investment um, much better than the average person. So um, I, I think it's great to see, um, you know, in the next kind of Bitcoin downturn, let's see how steady those hands are, of course. Um, but for now, I think it's a it's a really smart decision. Mm. Um, what's on Galaxy's roadmap for the remainder of 2024? Uh, are you planning to launch any new products? Uh, what can you share? I mean... I think everyone in this company hasn't been busier. <laughs> it feels like every division, there's something uh, going on. You know, in asset management, we just launched the Ethereum ETF. We just, uh, you know, closed on the first uh, first close for venture. Um, we announced a partnership with State Street um, to run some actively managed ETFs, which uh, will probably launch in late Q3. Uh, and then my team is going to be launching a multi-asset uh, crypto-themed uh, absolute return product. Um, so we've got our hands full here, and we're still working with the FTX estate on what I would consider more difficult type tokens at this point. Um, 
in our our trading business we got our swap dealer license i think we're the only crypto company uh, that has a swap dealer license at this point and that really just expands our opportunities in the size of the book we can have the customers that we work with um you know we continue to see a lot of activity on the trading side um they're constantly looking at opportunities um and then on our advisory side you know things are starting to pick up again um you know uh they're they're seeing more activity they're engaged in in more of the deals out there so um you know between oh, and then i should also mention our mining side you know we publicly said we're looking at our, our Helios data center um, down in Texas, which uh, can scale to 800 megawatts, um, to see if there are other, you know, practical uh, applications for that. Um, you know, many of these mining companies have been looking at AI high performance compute, and our facility is, is just situated exceptionally well, um, if it would make sense to do that. Um, we've already got you know, water cooling infrastructure. We've already got the freshwater pond there. We're right next to the grid. Um, there's just so many aspects where it gives us a lot of optionality. Um, and of course, we're going to take the the route where we think would deliver the best value. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's, that's a ton of stuff, Chris. Uh, you guys are doing a lot and it's pretty exciting news. And I wanted to ask a follow-up question on the State Street partnership. Um, can you elaborate a bit on that? It, it, are, they, are you planning to launch different ETFs or doing additional ETF products or financial instruments? Yeah, so we are in a blackout period right now. So unfortunately, I, I can't <laughs> yeah. really discuss much more than what was disclosed in the press release that there's, uh, you know, I think three different products that we plan to launch uh, in, probably at the end of Q3. That's exciting. Um, Let's talk tokenization because we're seeing uh, firms like your old firm, BlackRock, tokenizing and many others. Uh, is Galaxy planning to do anything around that? Um, or even if you're not specifically tokenizing funds, are you able to uh, trade with them and do different, uh, maybe add supplementary financial services and so forth? Yeah, it's something we've been looking at closely. I mean, we've been talking about tokenization um, ever since last year. Uh, we, we have a tokenization team. Um, we, we bought uh, GK8 out of the, the Celsius bankruptcy, which does a lot of the custody as well. Um, and there have been a number of institutions which have approached us about tokenization. We have publicly said that we're going to be working with DWS uh, in Germany uh, to, to do a, a stable coin, a euro-based stable coin. So we'll be doing tokenization in that route. In terms of uh, fun products and things like that, you know, Coinbase actually just announced the other day that they're doing a tokenized money market. Um, Franklin already had one. You've got BlackRock with theirs. So you're seeing a lot more interest there. And I look at these as, as test cases. They were a little bit easier to do and we're, we're seeing how they work. But ultimately what you'd love to do is to be able to use those assets as collateral on chain. Um, and once we start being able to use those type of assets um, on chain um, and the use cases start to really explode from there, I think that's going to start opening the door for other asset classes to be tokenized as well. Yeah. Um, let's uh, follow a question on the the stable coin that you, you, you and the folks there are going to uh, help to launch. Um, tell us a bit about that, which markets it's going to be available in. And in addition, uh, the, what do you think about this kind of what I would call the stable coin wars? It seems like everybody's launching one now. Ripple, the folks at Van Eck just launched one. Uh, what are your thoughts on everything there? So I don't think we've actually disclosed the markets that will be available in, um, but a euro based stable coin, um, you know, probably has a, a decent amount of, of use cases and practicality, particularly in the European market, if that's your base currency. Um, and the stablecoin wars is, is, is going to continue. Um, you know, it, it's a, a great product for the issuer right now because they're retaining all of the interest. Um, and it's been just a phenomenal moneymaker for, for Tether, for Circle. Um, so I think a lot of other institutions are looking at that as an opportunity. And, you know, when, when you have institutional investors stepping into the space, finally, uh, they don't know Tether. Uh, they do know Van Eck. Um, and I think brand 
has a big draw there. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you see other, you know, brand name institutions look at launching stable coins, um, trying to sniff out if there's an opportunity to really scale that up and build it out. Do you think there's, and this may be an obvious question, but, uh, or answer to it, but do you think there will be eventually be a point where it becomes too saturated and some folks are going to go out of business some con consolidation and, you know, some of the big whales buying up the small sharks or things like that? Yeah, that's what always happens. Um, so that's exactly what my expectation would be. You know, you really want to scale that up. Um, it, it's very much like the asset gathering business. And when you're subscale, um, it really just, it doesn't make much sense. So, you know, users don't want to use a stable coin that doesn't have a lot of volume, doesn't have a lot of activity. They tend to gravitate to the most used stable coins. And I think that's one of the reasons that USDT has been so successful and even USDC to a certain extent, although the regional banking crisis was a bit of a blow there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, people who are trading on chain, the pairs that they're trading with uh, are USDT or USDC. Uh, mm -hmm. You can still find some pairs in some of the other stable coins, but, you know, the, the liquidity pairs, the LPs that you see on some of the trading protocols, it's just, it's, it's much different than the liquidity you can find with those other two stables. Mm. Chris, I got some wrap up questions here for you. First, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? <sighs> My own metaverse. Um, where, where would you put your uh, Oculus on and go to? <laughs> uh, goodness gracious. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm going to have to think on this one. I, you know, I like horror movies. Um, so I, I could think of something funny as, as like, you know, a Friday the 13th <laughs> metaverse, uh, where you're constantly trying to avoid Jason. Right Jason. Now. That would be kind of fun to be. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a horror movie fan too, and that would actually be, uh, pretty interesting. And you have maybe the, uh, I, I, even though it's kind of corny, you kind of maybe have the Jason theme, scary music. Playing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, okay. Rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Uh, French fries. Favorite musician or band? It changes. Uh, right now I listen to a lot of Rufus du Soul. Favorite movie? Oh, I have like a top five list there. Um, probably Jaws. Mm. Uh, classic. Uh, favorite book? Uh, the entire Game of Thrones series. Loved it. Mm. And when you're not working at Galaxy, what are you doing for fun? I spend a lot of time with my family. I have uh, two girls uh, and a wife, and uh, I have a lot of fun with them. Chris, uh, pleasure chatting with you. you. You guys at Galaxy are doing some amazing things and uh, uh, looking forward to, you know, the releases are on State Street and, and all these different things. But thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, appreciate you having me.